The Grazadillo School of Business and Management at Pepperdine University proudly presents the Dean's Executive Leadership Series. This podcast invites top business practitioners and thought leaders to share their view on the real world of business. Well, thank you so much. That was fascinating and a tremendous overview of not only the industry, but Activision, of course, the merger of the two companies. So thank you so much oh, my for, pleasure. Yes. for sharing that with it's an us. an exciting story. Yeah. Yep. I loved your question about did we know anybody over 70 that had played games? So my mother was just here who uh, is over 70. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we, we were doing the Wii bowling game. Yes. And she's never bowled, I don't think, really bowled in her entire life. And yeah. so she was doing it with my husband, who you saw outside. Yeah. He's a big guy, 6'10". She beat him every single I time love it. they played. I love it. <laughs> and he hated it, so that he had to keep coming back and playing again and mm -hmm. again. And he never beat her, I don't think, the whole time she oh, was here. Great. So it was great fun. That's we had a, a good story. time. Well, I'm going to open the floor to questions from the audience and see what you all would like to ask Anne in the few minutes that we have remaining this, season, this evening. So, yes, Tal. Awesome. <laughs> Yep. It, yeah, it's a great observation and a, and a huge challenge for us. Um, our acquisition strategy, I talked about the fact that we've made, uh, we've uh, acquired uh, 12 studios in the last seven years. You know, picture what a development studio is, and I'll give you a perfect example. We have a studio in uh, Albany, New York. Uh, it was developed by two brothers who started uh, making video games when they were 15 in their parents' basement. Uh, and uh, they went on to develop this company and um, had some success as a small company and um, uh, then made the decision after we pursued them to sell their company to Activision. Um, the two brothers still continue to run the company and uh, it's in the space that they want it to be in with the employees they want to hire, paying people what they want to pay them. Um, the benefit of being part of Activision is that they have a regular flow of work and they know that the work that they do is likely to be published and sold. So um, they're in it for the joy of making the game and developing the innovative technologies to support the business. In fact, the little clip at the end where you saw the uh, handheld guitar hero with the little um, um, uh, attachment that goes into the DS, that was actually their, um, their creation, their development. And our view is that by allowing the founders to continue to run the business and giving them the freedom and the flexibility to maintain and uh, create and maintain the culture that they originally started the business with, um, just allows for more creativity and more innovation and a greater sense of feeling like they are a part of that enterprise versus being part of a big corporate monolith like Activision Blizzard. So that's the real plus of it, is that people feel a real sense of affiliation. And you know, I love to give these two examples. We've got two studios, uh, actually three studios in the San Francisco area. One is Shaba, and Shaba is uh, located in downtown San Francisco in an old um, in an old loft warehouse environment. So you know, picture what that looks like. And then you go up the road to Novato, and uh, we have a studio called Toys for Bob. And Toys for Bob makes mostly kids games. And uh, when you walk into Toys for Bob, <clears throat> in contrast to the loft in downtown San Francisco. It's decorated, it's the inside of a Quonset hut that's decorated like a tiki, uh, tiki hut. And it's got thatch roof, thatched roofs over every cube. And it's painted pink and green and blue. And um, they're quite proud of their interior, but that's their culture. It's fun, it's playful, it's joyful. Uh, and uh, Shaba is a, a little grittier, a little, um, um, you know, more um, uh, video game-like, I guess I could say. Um, but they, they, there's just a sense of a feeling of belonging. And uh, I think that's the real beauty of the, what we call the independent studio model. So here are the challenges. It's very tough for people to trade talent. You know, in a big company like ours, one of the benefits is you can take a really great artist from location A and put them into location B when you need them. Well, that's hard to do in our business because the guys in location A say, that's my artist. He does my work, not your work. Um, so it's hard to trade talent. Um, sometimes people are protective of their technology. So if they've developed an engine to run the game, um, they uh, don't want to share that with anybody because they feel like it's their 
um, work, and they're very proprietary about it. Um, <clears throat> we've gotten a little better about this as um, you know, people have you know, realized that they're not going to lose their identity and they're not going to be diminished in any way, shape, or form by sharing their talent or their resources or their assets or their technology. You know, people are getting to be a little more friendly about it. We've got some studios that are very cooperative with one another, and we have other studios that are, we have a couple studios that are very protective of what they've done. Um, we try to encourage people to share. We try to encourage people to have good dialogue at the studio head level, um, and, um, and I think we're making some progress in that regard. But it's, um, uh, we are considered the developer's publisher, and what that means is if you run an independent development studio, Activision is the publisher you want to be affiliated with because you know you're not going to get stripped of your leadership or your identity or your culture or the way you run your business. Um, and so good development houses who are looking to affiliate with the publisher oftentimes will prefer to be with Activision because they have that autonomy and degree of freedom than, than somebody who might sort of bring them into the fold and corporatize them. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, and if you want to talk about the interview later, I'm happy to talk to you. <laughs> I think we have more than one in the yeah. audience that are interviewing with Activision. So, Kyle, did you have a? Uh, game designers and programmers are the hottest talent and commodity out there. Uh, right. They're rather fickle. <clears throat> yep. What are, if you're looking at the publisher level, what are you doing to help attract and recruit them and also retain them? Yeah, it's a great question. Well, one of the ways to retain them is this independent studio model. They feel like they're a part of a... Uh, of an uh, enterprise that they can connect with and that they're not part of the big corporate office. So, you know, we have one studio in Santa Monica that is, um, you know, down the parking lot from our headquarters, but all the studios are spread out. San Francisco, Madison, you know, Iowa City, Albany. Um, so part of it is creating that sense of affiliation at the local level is how you retain them. The other way to retain them is um, to give them great games to make and ensure that they have the tools to make great games because great games mean more money for them. Um, we have sort of a profit sharing model at the studio level. So if you work on a very profitable game, if you're a game developer, even low, uh, low level uh, game developer in, um, in the business, you will reap the reward of the profitability of that game. So people really want to work for the Call of Duty studio. Um, and, uh, and it's not bad being affiliated with a Guitar Hero studio either. So um, giving them opportunities for um, increased income, I think, is, is, um, is what motivates them through the profitability of the game. There's a real connection there. Um, recruiting is, a, is um, an interesting challenge because <clears throat> there is, um, at the university level and, and at the tech school level, there are, they are, there are the beginnings of um, engineering curriculum associated with, uh, with game design, but there's not a huge number of them. And for the most part, it's not, um, it's not a immediately applicable. You know, it's more generic sort of game design curriculum. And so you, you take somebody out of one of those programs, they know a little bit about how to make a game, but you really learn how to make a game when you're making a game. Um, so really finding the schools that are starting to partner with publishers and developers. Uh, we actually participate oftentimes with the development of their curriculum um, so that the, it's closer to what we actually need. <clears throat> and um, so, you know, really targeting those schools and beginning to develop a reputation on campus of being a good employer and somebody that, you know, where they can grow their career and, and um, live in a place they want to live in and make, make cool games um, helps. And, you know, one of the ways we've done it at, at selected campuses, we actually will sponsor a game room. So we will actually build out a room that's got, you know, consoles and computers and we, you know, put all the games in. and. Um, and people begin to identify with Activision. Because in our case, at that brand of Activision is not as well known as our development studios. Everybody knows Infinity War, they know Neversoft, but they don't really know Activision necessarily. Blizzard, on the other hand, has a great brand um, recognition. And, um, uh, and so one of our challenges is just to make sure that people know who we are. Guitar Hero has helped tremendously. And um, you know, one of the things my college recruiting team just did this year is, um, the marketing guys for Red Octane, which is the, the group that uh, um, does Guitar Hero, did a, a Guitar Hero on tour where they had this giant bus. They went to 14 campuses across the U.S. The college relations people heard about that and said, we're going. We're getting on that bus. 
And um, so they actually accompanied the marketing people um, on their tour. And so for us, we've got great brand recognition on things like that. And so the more we can get people to see us, not just as a game, but also as an employer, um, they start to make that link. And um, people who are passionate about making games really want to work for a company like Activision. So, but they are a hot commodity, yeah. Chris, and then we'll come down here. That's a, a really interesting question. Um, you know, we are, uh, we have a majority shareholder uh, with Vivendi, uh, which is based in Paris, and they own Universal Music. And um, for us, that was a beautiful marriage because we now have access to the largest music company in the world, and a partnership with the Guitar Hero is, is a great benefit to us. But I do think that over time, there could potentially be a convergence uh, within the entertainment industry. You know, I. Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens. You know, when we take a look at our market cap um, in comparison to some of the motion picture companies right now, we're in a little better shape than they are. So it might be uh, the guppy swallowing the whale here. I don't know. But uh, it, it's, I think it's a very interesting possibility when you think about, you know, how things will change over time. I'm going to come down here to John. I think we'll make this our last question, but... Uh... Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I don't know the answer to for your first couple of questions, but, um, you know, uh, our, our CEO, um, who is um, who's just loving the growth of Guitar Hero, as you might imagine if you were a CEO of, that had a product like this, you know, s has said, you know, when are, when are we going to start charging the, uh, the bands for putting their songs on our game? You know, right now the licensing arrangement is just a little bit the opposite way. And, uh, <clears throat> but, um, but we've actually you know, gone after um, uh, um, several big bands and um, have been happy with the ones that we've gotten. And, and, um, and Aerosmith has been a great one for us. So you know, the, the, the future of Guitar Hero is actually, I think, um, even more compelling when you think about what other genres of music can you get into, and you know, country music or kids' music. Um, and um, you know we've started to certainly penetrate the European market, but we're, we're, we have to look for the absolute right balance between local music and American rock and roll. And um, because in some countries local music is much more popular than American music, but you know for us we'd like to have a balance of that. And then you think about, gosh, if you ever went into Latin America, which we haven't really penetrated that much with Guitar Hero, all of the opportunities for music in a culture that is so you know, music and festivity oriented. So we actually think the future of Guitar Hero as it relates to other genres of music is uh, sort of a boundless uh, opportunity for us. So I have one great Guitar Hero story great. that I have to tell Share though. Share it. <clears throat> when you talk about genres of music, um, I'm a big advocate of um, symphony music. My husband and I were at the symphony one night and um, it was a field trip night for high school kids. And um, so intermission came, and he walked up to the lobby, and he came back, and he said, see those three kids standing in the, in the aisle there? And I said, yeah. And he said, they're talking about Guitar Hero. So of course, I pop out of my seat. <laughs> I go talk to these guys. I said, I work, for, I work for the company that makes Guitar Hero. They said, you're kidding. They went on and on about how many kids play Guitar Hero and this and that. Now, these are all high school, high school musicians that are on a field trip. So this one kid looks at me with a straight face and says, do you think you'll ever do Oboe Hero? <laughs> <laughs> of course, I was trying to be kind. I said, you know, I haven't really seen that in the strategic plan for Red Octane, but, you know, it's possible. We are looking at other forms of instruments, and oboes might, you know, and I got myself and, you know, all wrapped around it, and I went, I'm not exactly sure, though, whether we're going to do oboe hero or not, but I thought it was quite cute. So. But it does say something about even the fact that serious musicians will play Absolutely. that game. Absolutely, yep. You know, I cannot play any instrument, but playing Guitar Hero is great fun. Yeah. You don't have to be a musician to yeah. do it, but to think that serious musicians like it too yeah. is a great thing. Yeah, good. Well. Uh -huh. well, wonderful. Well, it's really been a pleasure having oh, you well, with thank us. You so and much. I do want to, before we close, share one other Ann Weiser trivia oh. bit that's particularly interesting for us at Pepperdine. And actually, she, she graduated from Cal State Long Beach, but she actually started her undergraduate college career here at Pepperdine. So she's really an alumnus of Pepperdine. That's right. So. Uh, <laughs>
It was a long time ago. The campus looked, she was here in one of the fairly early years of the Malibu campus, long before this Drescher campus was built and before even the entire lower campus was built. Fall out, of so. 1975. Yeah. So we're so, glad to have you back. Yeah, thank you. It's thank quite you ironic so how, you know, the world is a circle. It Great. all comes back to the start. And you can see this podcast on YouTube University uh, that Pepperdine now has shortly in the next few weeks that will be up. We also did a podcast this afternoon that will be on iTunes University. So if you would like to see this again or learn more, you will have that opportunity uh, in several different, uh, several different locations. So thank you so much for being here. And we hope you'll be back on January 20th for Julia Stewart. I just want to put a plug in for Julia Stewart. I know Julia personally. She is a fabulous executive, an awesome speaker. And um, uh, Julia actually started her career in the restaurant industry as a server for IHOP. And now she's the CEO. She's yeah, an awesome woman. Story. So I, I, would actually, I would really strongly encourage you to come see her. She's terrific. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Anna.